What are the very most powerful five action steps we could take immediately to stop climate change? Well, the five most uh, effective immediate steps, I would say the, by far the most important step is putting a price, a rising price on carbon. But that phrase is used now by politicians around the world. And you have to be very careful in uh, parsing what they really mean by that because a price, some of them, they talk about different gimmicks, uh, different ideas of how we will uh, try to uh, increase the price of fossil fuels. Well, you actually want to do it in a way that promotes uh, carbon-free energies and does it in a way which actually spurs the economy. So if you, if you simply put a tax on, on uh, fossil fuels, well, it's very hard to make that global and it's very hard to get the public to accept it. The public doesn't want to pay more for gasoline at the pump. So what I've argued now for more than a dozen years is to put a fee on carbon, which you collect from the fossil fuel companies, but you distribute the money to the public, an equal amount to all legal residents. Then it turns out, if you look at the current distribution of fossil fuel use, 70% of the people would actually come out ahead. Uh, it, there's a and mostly low-income people would tend to come out ahead because they have a smaller carbon footprint than wealthy people who travel more and who have bigger houses and don't pay attention that much to their carbon footprint. Uh, but in order to stay on the good side, you have to begin to pay attention not so much I mean, there are certain big ticket items like a vehicle. You'd better buy a more efficient one the next time you get a, a new vehicle. But mainly it's just paying attention to the price of things on the shelf because those things that use more fossil fuels in their production will become more expensive. So you don't even need to think about it. It's something that will happen automatically. And the economists have studied this and shown that if you take a $10 a ton fee on carbon, for, collect that from the fossil fuel companies, and let it go up $10 a ton each year for 10 years. After 10 years, it's $100 a ton. It increases the price of gasoline at the pump by $1 a gallon, but it gives a couple thousand dollars a year to each legal resident. So you can, most people would come out ahead. And that uh, that rate of increase reduces U.S. emissions 30 percent in 10 years, which is much more than you can get by means of regulations um, or begging people. To, you know, the, let the economy uh, affect people's uh, energy choices. That's the way to get the fastest action, and that's the way that you can get an international approach because. It's just a single number, the carbon fee, or you can call it a carbon tax. If China wants to collect it as a tax, that's fine. They don't have a democracy and, and they could get away with that. But in any case, it's a single number and it's a way that you can make it international because if a country chooses not to have that, then the United States would put a border duty on products from the country uh, representing the effect of the, the fossil fuels on the production of that product. Uh, it's a, a well-established uh, uh, activity which uh, can be done at the border. And that encourages all countries to have their own carbon fee so they can collect the money themselves rather than have us collect it at the border. And the economists agree that this is this would work. Uh, it's just uh, has not been done yet. The list of five most effective actions, it, the carbon fee is the underlying
gain thing because that's what makes the others uh, possible. Now, we do need uh, carbon-free energy sources, for, especially for electricity. If we can get carbon-free electricity, then we can solve the problem. Um, there are other things. Transportation, it may be difficult to make that totally electric, so we may need some uh, other uh, developments. Um, it's hard to um, believe that in a country like the United States, for example, that we will go totally electric for all of our vehicles just because of the range restriction that that puts on the vehicles. Unless we come up with even better batteries and uh, that it, it's just physically uh, a difficult thing to, to do. So we may need a, a liquid fuel um, to replace gasoline. Uh, but, and there are different possibilities for that. Hydrogen is one of them. But those alternatives should be allowed to compete compete with electric, and as long as the price of carbon goes up, then the fossil fuels will have a harder and harder time, and the other alternatives will, um, you know, will compete against that. Um, I think that uh, we made a big mistake in the United States by effectively uh, giving up on nuclear power uh, several decades ago. And just sticking with this old uh, light water technology that was developed uh, 50 years ago, uh, partly based on the preference of the military people. But uh, we, there are many ideas uh, for how you could do nuclear power much uh, more efficiently and using most of the fuel instead of less than one-tenth of one percent of the fuel. Um, so I think that we should support the research and development of that kind of long lead uh, uh, engineering development that's needed. Uh, we have, we still have the best uh, uh, innovative potential in the United States and the best universities and, and in particular in, even in nuclear technology. Uh, but they're just not supported at a level that would allow uh, rapid progress in a commercial development of commercial reactors. So I think that is something that deserves attention. So nuclear power could be one of the keys to eradicating climate change. Yeah, I, well, I think it, it was always assumed that we would you know, we were moving from first from wood and then coal and then oil and then gas. We're, and then the next logical step was nuclear in the sense of more and more um, condensed form of the fuel and more convenient form. Uh, but, and you know, even back in the 1950s, Environmentalists thought, uh, well, nuclear looks like it's, it's better than some of renewables because renewables take up so much space and have some other, every energy source has some uh, problems. Uh, but uh, partly uh, based on the belief that, well, maybe we don't want uh, abundant clean energy because then uh, population increases and <laughs> they over, over, people overrun the planet. Well, um, actually, abundant, affordable, clean energy is actually our best chance of controlling population, I think, because in the countries where uh, abundant energy has been available, that's when countries have become wealthier. Then the population the fertility rate has declined. And that, so I don't think that was actually a, a legitimate uh, fear. 
But um, in any event, I think we need, we need alternatives. And so that's one that should be allowed to compete. We shouldn't have, uh, we've put in so much uh, R&D into renewables, which, and that's worked very well. The price of uh, solar power and wind power has come down dramatically because of all of that uh, subsidies and uh, R&D. And, but we have not done the same with nuclear power. So it's been kind of stuck on uh, old technology. I think that was a mistake.